all of the Central Asian states, perhaps except for Kazakhstan, have used this sort of uh, bargaining strategy. Now, Kazakhstan probably the least because of its long, long border with Russia and also its ethnic Russian constituency. Uzbekistan has arguably, arguably used this strategy the most uh, because of its strategic place. It's the most populous state in Central Asia. It bordered Tajikistan. It still borders Afghanistan. Um, and so this has been uh, one way that Uzbekistan has been at the top of the list. Remember, the Russians weren't very interested in Central Asia in the very early 1990s, right after independence. They were too busy with other things. But in 1995, Russian Prime Minister Viktor Chernomidrin um, comes into the region, and this sparks interest from the U.S. at last. Natural resources, the threat of Islamic fundamentalism, and a more aggressive Russian approach to the region lead to this increased U.S. interest. And so the Secretary of Defense, William Perry, comes to Uzbekistan and declares it, quote, an island of stability in this roaring sea of instability. At this point, Uzbekistan looked appealing. It was pushing for various degrees of independence, an increasing independence from the post-Soviet world, and it used the Perry visit to express concern over, quote, the voices of imperialism in Russia and the ever louder utterances of nostalgia. That was a quote from uh, Islam Karim, the president. Um, and he was right. I mean, in 1993, as I mentioned before, uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky's party came to power, well, didn't come to power, but gained uh, a huge, I think it was 20 plus percent in the parliamentary elections. This is a far right nationalist party um, that's calling for a reconstitution of the Soviet Union. Uh, so, so, uh, so Karimov is, is nervous. A month later, uh, he uses this new leverage to refuse to sign a CIS treaty for common border protection because he now has an alternate uh, partner, the United States. His, his broader foreign policy changed. There are a list of things that happen. Uh, one example is that, the U uh, that Uzbekistan supported a U.S. trade embargo on Iran, something that was opposed by the Russians, and it was assumed that Uzbekistan wouldn't because it was in Russia's sphere. And bam, 1995 changes all that. From 1996 to 1998, Uzbekistan plays up security, calling itself a, quote, frontline state, and increasingly notes Russian imperial ambitions. The Uzbeks openly condemn the CIS, which they're still a part of, but they condemn it as a threat to their sovereignty. Uh, Karimov writes in his book, he's actually written a lot of books, and he probably didn't write any of them, but in, in, in his book at the time, he wrote, reproachment with one state does not imply moving away from another. Okay, and all this was in italics. He was emphasizing this. So he was setting the ground right there for a game that would leave him as the arbiter between Russia and the U.S. Uh, so we're not necessarily moving away from another, so just watch your backs. In 1998, uh, there were NATO exercises in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, Kyrgyzstan was playing a similar game as, as the uh, Uzbeks at that point. The Russians were unhappy about this. Uzbekistan seemed increasingly in the U.S. sphere. In 1999, Karimov rejected Russian attempts to strengthen the CIS. He questioned the motives behind Russian troop deployments in various post-Soviet states, and he withdrew Uzbekistan from the CIS Security Pact, which I had mentioned before. Now you've got the context. This was thanks to an increased role of the U.S. The, the Uzbekistans gave their diplomatic support for the U.S. in everything that Russia hated. Uh, they backed NATO expansion, uh, the U.S. position on Iraq, the U.S. position on Kosovo, uh, uh, the Cuban embargo, and as a result, well, we, we can't say correlation is not causation, but having been a diplomat in the region, um, and in Uzbekistan in particular, I, 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 I'm fairly confident that all this um, helped. The USA doubled from $18 million to $33 million um, during that period, and, and, and it held the highest level bilateral commission that it had to date. These bilateral commissions being very prestigious, the U.S. and Uzbekistan coming together and working together and all that stuff. It gets front page, big pictures in the Uzbek press, state-controlled Uzbek press. Now, in August 1999, things begin to sour. We've got a, a major swing back to Russia, um, thanks to Islamic insurgents. The Uzbeks at this point accepted Russian military aid and commented, quote, We have made our relations with the U.S. better and better, but that's not against the Russian Federation. In 2000, uh, Putin condoned Karimov's tough approach toward terrorism. Karimov condemned the U.S. The Uzbekistan supported uh, the CIS anti-terrorism center that was created. It held the Commonwealth Southern Shield, 
military exercises with Russia. I was there for this. Uh, I remember the defense attache in the embassy being bitter that he wasn't invited because that's the custom. You should be invited to, to watch these things. When we had NATO exercises there, we invited the Russian defense attache to observe. So, so it wasn't so in your face. Um, so this is the beginning of a shift backwards. And why do you have this shift? Well, you had this shift, again, because of the Islamic insurgents that were coming over Uzbekistan's borders. And the U.S. was nice. The U.S. said, hey, we'll give you some goggles. You can see well at night. We'll give you some Jeeps. You can drive around. But the U.S. wouldn't give Uzbekistan. Uh, sorry, I should have changed this. The U.S. would not give Uzbekistan access to uh, lethal weapons okay, because of its human rights policy. And Russians would. Okay. Um, so, uh, so as we move into the, the 1999 to 2001 period, um, sorry, I really should have put these slides up, um, but now you see them all. Putin made his first post-inaugural trip out of the country to Uzbekistan. And the U.S. reacted by sending a top-level government official, um, actually several top-level government officials, from the FBI, from the CIA, from the State Department. Um, this is actually when uh, Albright came out. I was responsible for her trip to Bukhara. Uh, the U.S. promised more money, so we were fighting this game in 2000. And the Uzbeks responded, quote, we will cooperate with any country which helps us strengthen our air border. Um, let nobody seek any sort of politics here. There is only one policy here, security, security, and again, the security and tranquility of those people who live in our land. So um, there was an OSCE routine inspection uh, and, and, uh, and, well, that, that's not important. In the summer of 2000, there were more incursions. There was more Russian support. And the response by Karimov was, quote, we know and respect the positions and interests of Russia in Central Asia. We've always recognized them and will continue to recognize them. So moving further and further into the Russian sphere of influence. Well, I will mention this. Um, there, were, there were supposed to be routine inspections of the OSCE that same year. And I was there for this. And the, the Uz Uzbeks actually... Um, blocked the OSCE from coming in and inspecting their military, which you're supposed to do as part of the treaty. Um, and they did this because of Western criticisms. So things were getting more and more sour with the U.S. as things were getting better and better for the Russians. In June of 2001, Uzbekistan joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the terrorists were the greater threat than the Russians. And they made it a statement. They made a statement attacking the U.S., for its intention to violate the 1972 U.S.-Soviet Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty at the time. So all these things were going against the U.S. and towards Russia. Now, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is an important thing to uh, know about. It was started by Russia and China in 1996 to balance out the U.S. impact in the region. In general, it opposes the U.S. on, on strategies that make them relatively weaker, like missile defense. NATO enlargement, anything that's seen as a threat, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization opposes as a threat to Russia or China. They also had similar fears of secessionists and radical Islam, uh, because, of course, they've got the Chechens and they've got the Uyghurs and the Central Asians have their own um, threats. And so they had increased military cooperation. China, I remember, at this point was buying lots of stuff from Russia, aircraft carriers, radar systems, submarines, all these things. So China and Russia have similar fears of secessionists. They have um, opposition to, to the U.S. on strategies that are making them relatively weak. Um, and they've got increased military cooperation. So China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan joined this from the start. Turkmenistan proclaimed its independence as always. And the Uzbeks saw it as, as too much of a slap in the U.S. face at first in the, in the mid-1990s as it was cozying up to the U.S. until 2001. And by then, they saw threats from secessionists organized crime, terrorism, narcotics, and they felt the U.S. wasn't doing enough to help. And so, bam, they came back and they joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. September 11th, once again, changes all that. Um, at first, this was about security, and, and then you had a swing back. And you had, quote, a qualitatively new relationship based on long-term commitment uh, to advance security and regional stability, said the U.S., in other words, the U.S. came back and said, we need Uzbekistan again. Karimov offered its bases. It attacked Russian criticisms as, quote, an eruption of past stereotypes. In other words, going back to empire. 
Um, and, and so uh, the U.S. became dominant once again in the region. So again, the shifting back and forth. Russia then promised to strengthen the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And in return, the U.S. tripled aid from $55 million in 2001 to $160 million in 2002. U.S. criticism of Uzbekistan during this period um, declined in, the, so in, the, in this early period. But then by 2004, and criticism I mean in terms of human rights, by 2004 things change again. As the U.S. is less involved uh, in Afghanistan and more involved in Iraq and doesn't need Central Asia to the same degree. In 2005, there were a series of, well, you had a, a series of protests in Andijan, in Uzbekistan, and uh, and and the Uzbeks, uh, the Uzbeks killed a number, and we don't know how many, and I'm going to talk about this in a separate issue, but hundreds, hundreds of people were killed, uh, and the U.S. condemned them. The U.S. condemned them, um, and as a result, they they, the Uzbeks closed a U.S. base in Uzbekistan. So you had these constant movements going back and forth. Um, and ever since that period, tensions have been very high between the U.S. and Uzbekistan. And today, Uzbekistan is much further, as of 2014, much further in the Russian sphere um, than it is in the U.S. sphere. Um, so the point here is that Uzbekistan has had an amazing degree of latitude in its foreign policy. Because by keeping the U.S. always interested, to some extent, has helped temper Russia and allowed it to actually cozy up to the Russians in the CIS, in the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, with much less fear. So let's talk about the, the, the uh, big contrast here, Kazakhstan. When Uzbekistan in 1997 wrote of Russian chauvinism, Nazarbayev wrote in his own book that the CIS is, quote, a synonym for stability and security. So he was playing up, he needed Russia. Kazakhstan laughed off Western criticisms uh, during this time. He mocked the, the West. So for example, when the OSCE refused to recognize Kazakhstan's January 1999 presidential election results, Nazarbayev, who had 80% of the vote, highly unlikely, 80% of the vote reacted, well, you remember the Soviet times when turnout was 99.9% and the vote nine, went in favor of the incumbent by 99.9% too? Well, now he only had 80% support. So he said, well, you could say that we've allowed democracy to progress by 20%. So he was really making a mockery of Western criticism because he didn't need the West. After 9-11, while Uzbekistan's ties to the U.S. and Russia were clearly affected, Kazakhstan's relationships were much less so. There were no bases that were open there. It was further from Afghanistan, but not much further. But really, the Russians didn't want this to happen. And, the, and Kazakhstan's been much more on the side of the Russians throughout this period. And these dynamics continue to shape Central Asia today. But with China yet to exhibit the political pressure, it may decide it, it should use soon enough. Um, China is now in a much more advantageous position and can become a, a key to all this. And in the next class, we're going to look at the rise of extremism which has been a common motivation for, for all three of these powers to get involved in the region. Um, and we'll talk about the likelihood of this there. So that's uh, foreign policy in a nutshell.